Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for uh, uh, listening to this talk, and uh, also thanks to the uh, CRV conference uh, organizers for inviting me. So, uh, during this uh, talks, I'll be uh, discussing constraint uh, deep networks, uh, and I will uh, just take two use case uh, examples, uh, which uh, currently attract a lot of interest in computer vision. Uh, one example is focused on weak or semi uh, supervision and the other on uh, adversarial uh, robustness. So, uh, I mean, there is no doubt that uh, convolutional neural networks are dominating computer vision uh, nowadays. So let me take uh, a specific application example uh, here, which I will use uh, in the uh, weak supervision uh, case. and. Uh, Probably you're familiar with the problem. Uh, it's a very, very popular problem. So the task here is a dense prediction task where we need to assign uh, a semantic label to uh, every pixel. Uh, for example, in a street scene like this, you want to give a uh, label car or, or tree uh, or street and so on and so forth. Uh, and there are clear high profile applications of problems like this, uh, of dense prediction problems like this, uh, for instance, uh, autonomous driving. Um, this is also a very popular problem in uh, medical image analysis where uh, predicting um, uh, pixel wise classes or semantic segmentations could be very helpful in treatment planning and decisions or prognostics, diagnostics, or even you know, understanding complex disease and deriving biomarkers. So these are uh, also examples of works uh, in our team. So all this is great, um, uh, but there is there is there is there is a but. I mean, there is there is a problem that might be that might affect seriously the uh, the performance of current models and their generalization in in a breadth of uh, applications. So the interest is definitely uh, huge. Uh, but we have a bottleneck. So what I show you here uh, is pretty much uh, a visual illustration of full supervision uh, for segmentation and weak supervision. So for supervision, you would have to have a human uh, operator that labeled the image uh, pretty much at the pixel level. Uh, so if you take uh, standard data sets, for instance, like Cityscape, uh, then um, typically at average, uh, you would uh, need uh, uh, up to uh, perhaps one hour uh, or one and a half hour to label uh, one image. Uh, and you might need up to uh, hundreds, maybe thousands uh, of images to learn uh, meaningf meaningfully semantic segmentations. On the right hand side, you see an example of weak supervision where you don't have pixel label, uh, labels, but rather um, uh, weak labels at the image level, for instance, just text associated with the images. Uh, example, what objects are in the image? Person, for instance, horse, uh, background, and so on and so forth. So, of course, this is a much, uh, much easier uh, uh, labeling uh, effort. Uh, this is another example where uh, you want to have uh, you want to have a prediction that is uh, dense, uh, like what you see here uh, in the middle, but uh, you want your labeling effort to be very sparse. And this is typically a semi-supervision task where you have a few points that are labeled, but then a lot of uh, the rest of your data is not labeled. So this is essentially the tasks, and um, uh, and this is a serious bottleneck. Uh, for this specific problem. Um, and even if you further go to other application domains, important ones like medical image analysis, then full annotations are even much more problematic. Uh, you know, we take examples uh, in different applications where we are not anywhere close uh, to the 10K images that we have in Pascal VOC, for instance, for uh, natural images or the 5K images in cityscapes. Uh, and also uh, keep in mind, you cannot give this annotation task to everybody. You need an expert, in this case, a doctor or a radiologist to label uh, these images. You cannot do crowdsourcing for this type of uh, labeling uh, tasks. On top of that, you might be dealing with 3D data, 3D plus time data. So uh, the labeling task might take an expert a few 
uh, hours. So I don't think I would have to spend a lot of time convincing you that um, there is a need to uh, leverage a huge amount of unlabeled data uh, and weak annotations uh, to bring uh, these algorithms to uh, a next uh, level without having to label uh, everywhere. Another interesting problem is uh, when uh, you have uh, differences in the distributions between your labeled data uh, and the new data that for which you want your model to generalize. Let's say, for instance, you train on MRI images and then you apply your model uh, to CT images uh, and then your model does not work uh, at all. So this is what people call uh, unsupervised domain adaptation, how you make your uh, model generalize uh, very well. And this is a form of uh, semi-supervision uh, as well. Um, and this is, I mean, domain shifts are everywhere. Uh, you might be happy about the cityscape data sets that uh, was built in Zurich, uh, in street scenes, uh, and then you train your model on this, and then you go to Shanghai, or you go to Montreal, uh, and then your model performance drop significantly. Uh, so domain shifts are everywhere, but you cannot uh, label uh, everywhere. And keep in mind, to build a data set, uh, that has 5,000 images, uh, it's a huge uh, uh, amount of human uh, effort. So basically labeling one image might take up to 90 minutes uh, at average. So, so this is the idea, uh, but at the same time, uh, in different application domain, we might have a lot of prior knowledge, prior knowledge that do not come necessarily from the data, uh, not from the images or their uh, labels or weak labels. So if I take an example, I will take a very specific example, uh, medical imaging, uh, for instance. Yes, uh, we might be dealing with a lack of annotations, but we have anatomical knowledge, for instance. Uh, we have the text reports and the radiology reports that are associated with the images. We have several modalities. So all this might provide prior knowledge that you might use to kind of guide uh, deep classifiers to learn more meaningful representation, even if uh, your data uh, or the amount of label that you have uh, is very limited. So um, here I will just take a, a very simple uh, example, but again, uh, I mean, um, this can be generalized to a different type uh, of priors. And the example is an anatomical example. So uh, let's say you want to try to uh, label an MRI of the heart and you want to find the left ventricle. And then you have an information about the size of the left ventricle, at least rough information. You know, you know that uh, the, the cavity of the heart of a human is between two uh, value. I mean, uh, it cannot be very big or cannot be very small. Uh, for instance. So, uh, and then in this way, you might want to impose these constraints. It's a knowledge that you have about the problem. So, uh, this brings me to this very general form uh, of problem where uh, you basically have uh, E of theta, which is a standard loss defined over labeled data points. Example, some kind of cross entropy. And then you have a set of constraints, right, which embed knowledge uh, about uh, your problem. So in this case, uh, the constraint might be defined over data points that are uh, not labeled, for instance. So let's take an example. So suppose that you, uh, in this example, uh, in the upper row, you wanna try to find these regions, which are the cavity uh, of the heart. So this is a full supervision. Uh, uh, these are full supervision masks uh, and then uh, what you want to do, you want to learn from just, you know, a few labeled data points, a fraction of, of, of those masks. And of course, at, at test time, you want to have uh, these uh, solutions. So uh, this is kind of an example of constraints that are embedded on the output of a deep network. Uh, so uh, the probability output uh, telling you whether the pixel is, is, is a pixel of uh, the heart cavity or not, uh, are kind of good proxies to, uh, to 
uh, evaluate the size uh, of the region. So you can think of this constraint as some kind of unsupervised constraint in which you embedded knowledge uh, about uh, this target uh, region. So uh, one way to do this, uh, I'll, I won't have time to focus on uh, the technical optimization or aspects of this, but uh, I'll, have, I'll have to point to a few important uh, aspects uh, of it. So keep in mind that the constraint depends on the output of a deep network. So it depends on all the parameters, perhaps millions of parameters of the deep uh, network. So then you have to solve this. And one way to solve this is to put these constraints into some penalties, uh, basically penalizing uh, violation of these constraints. Uh, and then this is maybe the most, most basic way of, of, of dealing uh, with constraints. But then one problem would be how to, uh, how to actually fix the weight of uh, this penalty. So uh, the best way in standard convex optimization to deal this, with this is to use Lagrangian uh, optimization. Uh, but this unfortunately does not materialize in the context of deep networks. So for several technical reasons, uh, in fact, uh, which I would not uh, discuss in, in details here uh, due to the uh, fact that I don't have uh, a lot of time, uh, but uh, I, I could quickly point out to the fact that there are a couple of recent works, uh, including from our team that try to uh, solve uh, constraint CNNs and to uh, have some approximation of uh, Lagrangian optimization. Uh, but uh, mostly people use penalties for dealing with CNNs. Uh, so here I can show you some results uh, about this very specific uh, case. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's an interesting case. So what you can see here, uh, the black curve is the full supervision uh, performance. Uh, the green curve is by just adding size constraints, then um, we were actually, and this is the exciting part of, of this plot, we were actually able to, uh, to have 90% uh, uh, of full supervision performance uh, with just a fraction of the label, which is just uh, basically 0.1% of the label. The, the, disturb, the disturbing part is that uh, Lagrangian optimization is not doing a good job here, uh, and actually Lagrangian optimization is supposed to be uh, better uh, than penalty in standard convex uh, optimization. So uh, just a few pointers to a few works, for example, this work from our team where we try to approximate Lagrangian optimization uh, uh, in deep networks with some promise, promising uh, performances. Uh, but this is, this is pretty much an ongoing research also in uh, our group or other groups where people try to, uh, to, to solve uh, constraint CNN uh, problems. Uh, this is another example of penalties that are very useful, uh, this, uh, uh, in this case for natural images. It's, um, uh, it's very standard. Uh, conditional random fields that have a long history in supervision, uh, basically put into uh, a loss term. Uh, and again, in this case, we are basically just telling the neural network, yes, you don't have a lot of uh, annotations. You basically have a few points per image, uh, those scribbles. But be aware, we are giving you some more priors, uh, perceptual priors, uh, that tells you that the boundary should be smooth and they should align with edges. Uh, and this turned out to be very helpful, in fact. Uh, almost reaching full supervision performance uh, with 3% uh, of the label. Uh, so these use cases shows you actually the interest of how you could basically leverage unlabeled data with some unsupervised loss terms that embed priors uh, about the problem. And uh, I believe this is very interesting. So the second part of my talk, I still have uh, basically six minutes, is, is another but, which is a very serious one, I would uh, say also. Can we trust, trust deep learning models? You might have seen already examples uh, of um, adversarial attacks. Uh, so what you can see here is one image uh, of a, a, a retriever and, uh, and then basically a perturbation, so the image X and then a perturbation delta, uh, which is barely perceivable. Uh, by human, and then the classifier has a totally different prediction, which is a microwave uh, here. And this is what we call adversarial examples, that you see here on the right-hand side. And uh, this is not just uh, a matter of toy examples of generating these uh, examples. Uh, this happens also in real life, in serious situations, and it might have serious 
consequences. Uh, for example, what you see here, uh, this is probably a famous uh, YouTube example where uh, the autonomous driver wa was about to go into the intersection and then the human operator had to intervene in the last million. So this is an adversarial example that happened in real life. Uh, so uh, technically, uh, what we want to do is basically generate these adversarial examples and try to use them to make deep networks more robust to these uh, perturbations. So what you want to do basically is try to uh, find the perturbation delta. You try to minimize it because if delta is huge, then it becomes meaningless. Uh, problem. Of course, you would you would make a mistake. Even a human would make a mistake. And then, subject to the fact that uh, what you see here, this discrete constraint is basically saying it has to make a mistake. It does not have to predict the true label, right? So, uh, so again, this is a constraint at CNN. Uh, so I'll skip a little bit uh, the details. But one way to do it would be to do it with a penalty. Um, basically so you try to uh, pay a cost if the prediction uh, is correct and this is basically the very popular Carlini and Wagner uh, methods uh, and again uh, one problem with uh, penalty approach for embedding constraints is that you have to fix the weight of the penalty in this case it's this uh, c and unfortunately this c vary uh, from one image to another so in the context of adversarial attack you want to do this on a large number uh, of images to be able to attack different models and networks. So this is not actually scalable because you have to search for the best C uh, for every image and then you pretty much have to run and solve this optimization problem many times for uh, every image. So uh, this is just a quick description of uh, recent work in our team uh, which have had quite competitive performances in black box uh, attacks. So what we do here, we relax completely uh, the, the, the penalty uh, approach. Uh, what we do is a kind of uh, a direct, a more direct and a simple way to handle uh, the discrete constraint that we want to impose, uh, which is basically making a wrong prediction for that specific image. Uh, so here, uh, changing the norm, uh, of the perturbation delta is a binary decision in our case. Uh, and the figure illustrated here uh, very well. So given the gradient that try to maximize the loss and induce a classification error, we project back on a hyperbole with either increased radius or decreased radius based on whether the constraint is satisfied. The constraint is in this case is whether the example is adversarial or not. So in this way, we go much in a much quicker way toward the decision boundary or the class uh, boundary without having to deal with the weight uh, of uh, the penalty. Uh, and we deal in a naturally with the discrete constraints, which is actually this constraints that we want to impose, which is uh, basically inducing an error of the classifier. So uh, I won't be uh, able to discuss uh, more details uh, about this. So this is pretty much a high level uh, description. Uh, but what can I can tell you is that this could achieve pretty much the same level of success of attacks, uh, but with much lower numbers of gradient calls, what you see here on uh, the right hand uh, side. And as a result, it can be used and deployed in black box attacks where you don't know uh, the models uh, uh, that you are attacking or uh, uh, the networks that were used. So you can deploy this with large numbers uh, of images. Uh, and as a result, this was one of the top, um, uh, the top performing methods in, in, in untargeted black box uh, attacks during uh, the recent adversarial vision uh, challenge. So uh, this is pretty much it. What I put here is also a couple of um, references related to uh, to um, the few uh, works and aspects that uh, I just discussed. Uh, so uh, you have also the codes that are publicly uh, available. I'll be happy also to share uh, these slides uh, if uh, you are 
uh, interested. And uh, of course, if you have any questions, you have my email just at the first page. So feel free and do not hesitate to uh, drop me uh, an email. So uh, thank you uh, very much and enjoy uh, the virtual conference.